Chapter 33 Captain's Quarters, ISS Warrior High Orbit, Britannia Granger awoke with a start. He'd spent over an hour tossing and turning, worrying about Operation Ground War, and when he'd finally fallen asleep, the usual dream returned. What he was sure was the actual memory of being held by the Russians and Swarm four months ago. His sheets were wet with sweat, but he'd kicked the blanket off and he was shivering. A glance at the clock told him he'd gotten three hours, and with a sigh he rolled over and heaved himself to his feet. Three hours was considered good sleep these days. A cold shower helped wake him up, and he was glad he'd finished quickly, because as he finished dressing, the door chimed. Come in, he grumbled. The door slid open, and outside he could see the two Marines standing guard, flanking Shelby Proctor who poked her head in. You dressed? Barely. Come in. He waved her through and pulled up a chair. Sorry, no time to chit-chat, she said, refusing the chair. I just wanted to let you know. Well, I've got good news and bad news. Hit me, he said, applying shaving cream to his stubble. In the mirror, under the harsh light of the vanity, his eyes looked bruised, but that was just the deep shadows cast by his fatigue. The bad news. I'm sorry, Tim, I've tried everything I can think of, and ran through test after test with my team, but we just can't seem to block the metaspace signal like the swarm can. I'm sure we'll figure it out, but not yet. He grumbled. That was bad news, especially in light of her findings yesterday with the blood tests. With most of the Admiralty and ship captains infected with the backdoor virus, he didn't know who he could trust. Zingano was clean, fortunately, but he couldn't very well quarantine every single one of his infected admirals and captains. The fleet would fall apart. Please tell me the good news makes up for it. It might. I had a few team members do some tests, and they've collaborated with their counterparts at IDF Science, and we might have a pharmacological solution. A temporary one, at least. Pharmacological? You're going to drug them all? He ran the razor across his cheeks, revealing clean, wrinkled skin underneath the stubble. Time to do something about those wrinkles, too. Ah, hell, who am I kidding? I am. It turns out that one of the many things the backdoor virus does when triggered is increase the levels of oxytocin and serotonin in the brain. Those influence our feelings of love, of friendship, and similar bonding emotions, making it easier for the virus to do the rest of its work, influencing the host to do certain acts. But if we simply block those chemicals, suppress them, then the virus can't work as well as it usually does. So, basically make us all assholes. Great. You've tested this? His face was clear, and he moved to his neck, drawing the razor carefully across his Adam's apple. On a lieutenant at IDF Science that we discovered was infected. I first hit him with a metaspace signal that I suspect mimics a swarm signal, and he showed elevated levels of oxytocin and serotonin. Then, after I injected him with the suppressant and hit him again with the signal, the level stayed the same. Will it work? No way to tell, without an actual swarm signal telling someone infected with the backdoor virus to go do something. At the very least, when the signal comes, the drug may give that person pause, may give them some moments of clarity where they realize what they're doing, and may even delay action long enough for someone else to see them and realize what's going on. He finished up and wiped his face clean. Sounds risky, but I guess it's all we've got. Besides, he sat down and pulled his boots on. Risk is our calling card. She followed him to the door when he stood up. I've distributed the suppressant in pill form to the top brass, and every captain and commander in the fleet participating in Operation Ground War. Good. As harebrained as that mission is, it won't do us any good to have captains with loose screws. Zingano messaged me. We're to leave in three hours. You all ready? Well, after I spent the night working on the suppressant, I huddled with my science team to work on the quantum field versus relativistic gravitational field theory I mentioned to you earlier, and— He stopped and grabbed her arm. Wait. Shelby, are you telling me you didn't sleep last night? He looked into her face when she turned back to him. She looked exhausted, and almost as old as Granger, even though she was at least thirty years younger. I dozed in between test essays, she said defensively. Look, Tim, sleep can wait. Don't worry, I've had plenty of coffee and a few energy pills, and then some more coffee. Believe me, I'm fine. He let go of her arm and grumbled as they continued. 
I'm warning you. One more day like this and I swear I'll order you to bed. He'd been kidding, of course, but he softened his tone further. I worry about you, Shelby. I worry you're working yourself too hard. She smiled back at him. I'm touched, Tim. Really, I am. Now, go show the same concern to the rest of the crew. They need it. Before they walked on to the bridge, he gave a lazy salute to her. Yes, ma'am. He gave a lazy salute to her. Yes, ma'am. Chapter 34 Bridge, ISS Warrior Interstellar Space, 2.4 light years from Sirius Hold the next Q-jump, said Granger. Distance? Point one light years, sir, said Ensign Prince. Doubt nodded him. He was uneasy with the plan put forth by President Avery and General Norton. He supposed he was hesitant because the plan was, put bluntly, utterly cutthroat. Take advantage of a potential friend before they'd even determined the nature of that friend. Use them as a tool against the swarm before understanding them or knowing anything about them. And yet Avery's logic was sound in a brutal sort of way. The human race was on the brink and when it came to the basic survival of the race, something to ensure that humans would always be found somewhere in the universe, they could stop at nothing, nothing, to prevent total annihilation, even if betrayal meant giving up their souls in exchange for their lives. But Granger didn't care about his life, and he supposed neither did Avery. They cared about the future, and yet he had to be sure they weren't walking into a trap. After the final Q-jump, take us most of the way in, but stop ten million kilometers short. We need to see what's going on before we jump all the way in. Aye, aye, sir. Moments later, the star field on the view screen shifted again. Full scan, Mr. Diamond. Optical EM bands. Ensign Diamond nodded. At ten million kilometers, the light is about thirty seconds old, sir. Understood, Ensign. The sensor crew performed the scans. Picking up the super dreadnought, sir. Right at the rendezvous point. Is it alone? Yes, sir. Granger stroked his chin, finally smooth after that much-needed shave. His body was protesting the ungodly schedule, but there would always be time to sleep on the beach when this was all over. Or when he was dead, which, if he was being honest, was a more likely scenario. Extend scan to all directions. Anything? The sensor crew busied themselves, and a minute later Diamond shook his head. Nothing, sir. We're in the middle of interstellar space, nothing around for light years. Or at least light minutes that we can tell. Of course, said Granger. There could be a swarm fleet waiting just a light day away. They could have been waiting there for half a day and we'd never know it. Yes, sir, agreed Diamond. Granger paced a few times across the bridge before deciding. Very well. Take us the rest of the way in. They've probably detected us by now. This was probably good for them, too. Let them see from a distance that we're coming alone. Even though a 500,000-strong army is right behind us. Q-jump in five, said Ensign Prince. Granger glanced back at the XO station and caught Lieutenant Diaz's eye. The deputy XO nodded back, indicating his readiness. Proctor was holed up in her lab, continuing her cowboy research, as she called it, right up until the last minute before battle operations were scheduled to begin. Granger was supposed to keep the Skiora talking for at least an hour. The screen shifted one final time, revealing the immense mass and mind-boggling length of the super-dreadnought. It stretched off into the distance, its hull mostly dark and invisible due to the lack of sunlight, except where it was punctuated by thousands of lit viewports. I just can't get used to how massive that thing is, said Diaz. Granger paused his pacing in the middle of the bridge. And that there's six of them. He turned to tactical. Begin scans. Go through the checklist provided by Colonel Barnard of things to confirm. Ship layout, atmospheric conditions, numbers of life signs, automation systems, all of it. I'll buy you as much time as possible. We're being hailed, sir, said Ensign Prucha. Badge it through. The familiar form of Vice Imperator Scythia Krull filled the screen. One of her deputies stood nearby another Skiora woman who eyed Granger carefully. 
Captain Granger, you've come. We were undecided of whether you would arrive or not. Of course I've come. We owe you a great debt. To not come would have been disrespectful to you. And you have no idea how much we're about to disrespect you. Thank you, Captain Granger. I've summoned my people's... I believe a close translation to your language would be Bonded Council of Seven, our leaders and matriarchs. They come for a council of war, a war to finally liberate all of the family from its master. Granger raised an eyebrow. You have your own concord out of seven? The swarm appropriated the social structure from us, almost ten thousand years ago. They don't have original ideas, Captain. That is their failing. I've debated with my sisters as to whether they are truly alive or not. Living beings must create to survive. The swarm does not create. It appropriates. It infests and corrupts and controls. And so when the swarm came to our world, they took what they thought would serve them, and destroyed the rest. And yet here you are, said Granger. He weighed the benefits of putting up a skeptical front this early in the conversation, but he supposed if he had entered into dialogue under the pretenses the Skiora assumed, he'd most likely sound doubtful at first. Either way, Vice Imperator Krull took it in stride. Over the millennia, the swarm permitted us to retain those parts of our culture they found useful. And now finally we have discovered the key to thwarting their control over us. Granger was becoming more skeptical by the second. How could a species, after millennia of control by the swarm, suddenly figure out a way to break free, when the swarm's control extends so completely over every individual they dominate? How does one suddenly just spontaneously cast off complete control? Though he remembered, the Domasi had already proven it was possible. And how is that? How was it that you suddenly found yourselves free of swarm influence? To be honest, it seems suspect. The Vice Imperator's face sagged a little. Granger couldn't even guess what the expression meant. Captain Granger, we are here, all of us, all of my people, because of you. What you see here, this ship, and five others like it, contain all that remains of the once proud race of the Skiora. And we are here, and free, because of you. And we are here, and free, because of you. Chapter 35 Russian Singularity Production Facility High Orbit, Penumbra 3 Welcome to Penumbra Station, Eamon said Ambassador Volodin at the exit of the docking hatch. The crew had been instructed to remain with the ship. Only Isaacson's Secret Service escort was allowed to accompany him, though Isaacson had half a mind to dismiss them too, given their inability to protect him during the bombing attempt on his life two months ago and the fighter attack immediately after. The swarm had penetrated deep into the bureaucracy. He couldn't even trust his security folks. Yuri, this is incredible. Is this the rock that was caved out by... You know, it is. Actual construction took far longer, of course, but the excavation only took a few months. He started walking down the hallway. Come, President Malakoff awaits. Volodin took them deep into the complex, passing first by a series of bays holding equipment, large containers, and storage boxes which merged gradually into a section of the station devoted to experimental work with gleaming high-tech labs, high-energy power sources and gas chambers, and then through what appeared to be the administrative area. The desks and cubicles gave way to a large expanse filled with what looked like natural light reflected in from Penumbra's sun. The space in the middle stretched up at least fifteen levels, each floor bordered by a railing that wrapped around the free expanse in the middle. It wasn't crowded, but the occasional worker glanced their way, sometimes recognizing Isaacson with wide eyes, but no one stopped to say anything. Instead, Volodin led them to an elevator shaft near the central railing on their deck. Its walls were clear, and Isaacson felt a moment of vertigo as they shot up through the empty space. At the very top, at least a hundred meters above the ground floor, 
when they arrived at the executive offices. Lush carpeting covered parts of the floor of the atrium, and the fine surfaces of marble, granite, and crystal glittered everywhere. There was even a giant fish tank with coral and exotic, colorful fish that could be seen in another reception area nearby. The walls were lined with giant pictures of President Malikoff in various manly situations. One showed him at the top of Everest, shirtless, no oxygen tank in sight, looking through binoculars at some unseen sight off in the distance. Another was of him doing what looked like a pull-up, dangling two kilometers from the famous Whittingham Suspension Bridge connecting two towers in Britannia's capital city. Frame after frame boasted of his physical and testosterone-filled exploits, occasionally softened by a random image of him caressing a poor, wrinkled grandmother's face, or of the president sitting on a tree trunk in a picturesque setting, with children on his lap and surrounding him, fawning over him playfully, yet worshipfully. They reminded Isaacson of the old, kitschy Christian paintings of Jesus, showing him in similar settings, all unbiblical but inspiring to the simple people, that needed such unrefined and simple-minded inspiration in their lives. Oh, the poor masses, taken in by such tripe and propaganda. And yet Isaacson couldn't help but admire it. Crude, but brilliant, he thought. If I ever knock Avery off, I should keep something like this in mind. He automatically cringed, expecting the usual shock that accompanied the treasonous thoughts whenever they slipped through his guard and sure enough his head felt like it contracted and twisted in pain. It only lasted a moment, but enough to make him sway and nearly lose his footing. Surely Avery couldn't monitor him from this far away, could she? And the reaction simply become automatic on his part? Eamon? Are you all right? Isaacson waved him off. Fine, just uh, dizzy from the ride up. A door opened nearby. Isaacson expected to see a security contingent come in and escort him to the Russian president. But instead, just a single man walked through, dressed in a simple business suit with an old-fashioned red power tie, clicking along the marble floor in sensible but fashionable black shoes at a confident pace. Gazing straight ahead toward Isaacson, his hand extended for a greeting. President Malikov. Extended for a greeting. President Malikov Chapter 36 Bridge, ISS Warrior Interstellar Space, 2.4 light-years from Sirius Because of me. The words began to dawn on him, the gravity of their meaning finally weighing on him. Are you telling me that your ship is full of your entire society? Families? Children? This ship and the other five contain your entire civilization? That is correct, Captain. Which meant he, Granger, was guilty of a genocide. Or at least one-seventh of a genocide. And the ship I destroyed? Over in Dira? The Harmony. Held the once great house of the Trell. Fifth family of the bonded Council of Seven. Vice Imperator Terry Trell. My third cousin was their matriarch. Granger stumbled to his seat. How many? Excuse me, Captain. How many of your people were on that ship? The Harmony? It doesn't matter, Captain Granger. All that matters is that we make plans— Granger waved a hand dismissively. It matters to me. How many? Vice Imperator Krull hesitated. Approximately fifty billion. The words pierced him to the core. He felt hollow and distant, like he was observing the situation from above his head. But how is that possible? Our scans of your vessel reveal only around 200,000 life readings. Does your ship carry similar numbers? As the Harmony? No, not by far. We only number 14 billion here in the House Krull on the Benevolence. The life readings you see are accurate, Granger, but most of us are mothers, and our children are already born, inside us, waiting for us to give them the exterior life. I still hold over twenty-two thousand of my children within me. Twenty-two thousand? 
breathed Granger incredulously. How is that possible? They are embryos, of course, and mostly composed of brain tissue, but even though they lack the rest of their bodies, each is a fully developed individual, a person. And they will all be born later, to the exterior life? Some will. Most won't. Most will live the interior life for their whole existence, and they are linked to me. They are part of me. I hear their thoughts, their passions, their fears, and their hopes. Each of them has memory, and some are suited to remembering certain things, certain concepts. The majority of mine are suited to remembering communication, diplomacy, and relationships, and so I was chosen as vice-imperator of my house at the moment of liberation. When was that? When were you liberated? You don't know. Her face stretched. Surprise. This happened two days ago, during the battle over your world. Indira, you called it. One moment we were thralls of the Valerisi. Then you came. You destroyed the Harmony, coming with such speed and destruction that it was ripped into pieces. Some of those pieces broke off and collided with singularities. Those were the first to be liberated. And from them it spread. And through our metaspace link, a good translation might be the ligature, the effect spread to us all. Something about what you did saved us all, in spite of the unthinkable destruction. Finally, Granger understood. The singularities, the swarm matter. When those doomed Skiora fell into the singularities, they emerged cleansed from the virus. Somewhere. Just like Granger. And through the metaspace link, the effect spread to their whole race. Yet the Vice Imperator seemed to have no idea of how it actually happened. Which was good. The fewer people who knew about the effect, the better. If they could keep the swarm in the dark about their knowledge, it would give them more of a tactical advantage. But he was still wary. Was this a trick? The swarm could be feeding her what to say, drawing him in, gaining his trust, waiting for him to lower his guard. Except, why? The super-dreadnought, the benevolence, outpowered and outgunned the warrior over a thousand to one. If the swarm wanted a shot at Granger, they didn't need subterfuge to get it. Just a scant minute in battle with that monstrosity of a ship would be enough to finish him off. Unless, he paused, weighing the possibilities, the swarm wanted something else. Paused, weighing the possibilities, the swarm wanted something else. Chapter 37 Bridge, ISS Lincoln Interstellar Space, 2.5 light-years from Sirius General Norton, we're at one hour, sir. The general paced the bridge of the ISS Lincoln, circling the captain's chair, where the ship's commander waited for the order that would take them into battle. And no word from Granger? None, the comm officer replied. No metaspace transmissions, nothing except the constant background noise of swarm communications, right at the frequencies and phase patterns you gave to us, sir. Norton chuckled. Ah, Commander Proctor. At least you're good for something besides being Granger's lapdog. He turned back to the science station, where Commander Alonso, IDF's associate chief scientist and director for intra-swarm communications, stood monitoring the progress of his science crew. Commander, any progress in actually breaking down what they're saying out there? No, sir, but we've definitely built off of Commander Proctor's work. She was never able to achieve such tight-phase discrimination as we have. Overconfidence, Commander Alonso. Overconfidence, arrogance, and hubris. They're Granger's call sign. And it's rubbed off on his XO. If she would simply collaborate with IDF science more instead of striking out on her own, trying to be the hero, thinking herself special and above the rules, we may have won this war months ago. But she's just like the bricklayer, just like Granger. Commander Alonso shrugged. She has given us perfectly good data. A little rough, some of her conclusions are a little hasty, but really, she's done uh, adequate work. And yet, if she had have collaborated with you, she'd be scanning for the backdoor virus frequency on the proper phase configuration. But it's obvious why she's not doing that. I don't believe it's that she can't, Commander. It's that she won't. 
She knows that if she lets that knowledge out, it'll compromise Granger's ability to work, because I'll catch him in the act, talking with the swarm, collaborating, just like he's doing now. The science chief shuffled uncomfortably. Well, sir, that is one interpretation of the data we're seeing. Norton turned to face him threateningly. What other valid interpretation is there? Granger is there, with the swarm dreadnought, talking to them, virus to virus, mind to mind, sharing our secrets. We clearly see the metaspace signals. What the hell are they doing if not that? Silence. Commander Alonso had no answer. Exactly. Norton turned to watch the view screen. The camera was panned wide, out toward their fleet. Thousands of troop carriers, hundreds of thousands of marines, and half of Zingano's fleet, just in case. And one other thing, floating just beyond the fleet. None of the vessels were lit, except for a few visible viewports that cast pale, weak light on the hull around them. But even without the light, enough stars were blocked out to make it obvious that this was the largest fleet of ships IDF had ever assembled. Give them ten more minutes. If we don't hear from Granger by then, we're going in. Relay the orders to Zingano and Colonel Barnard. Commander Alonso made one last attempt. But, General, if what you say is true, if you think Granger is being played by the swarm, or even colluding with them, then he already knows our battle plans, our secret. Wouldn't it be wiser to pull back, regroup, and think this through? Norton snorted a harsh, short laugh. Well, it's a good thing I didn't tell Granger all my secrets. He glowered at the scientist. Stick to numbers and data, Commander. Leave the tactics to me. Stick to numbers and data, Commander. Leave the tactics to me. Chapter 38 Bridge, ISS Warrior Interstellar Space, 2.4 light-years from Sirius Granger glanced at the countdown timer. He'd promised General Norton and Admiral Zingano he'd keep the Sciora talking for at least an hour. Enough time for Warrior to take more detailed scans of the Dreadnought, compare the readings to the originals and the projections from Norton's tactical modeling crew, and pass any corrections on to the invasion force when it finally arrived. Thirty-nine minutes. And now Granger wasn't even sure he wanted the invasion force to show up. The entire Sciora civilization was on those six remaining ships. Could he participate in a genocide of a people that was itself in thrall to the swarm? Even if it meant deliverance of his own. Too many questions. Excuse me for one moment, Vice Imperator. He signaled to Ensign Prucha to mute and thumb the calm open to Proctor in her lab. You've been listening in, Shelby? I have, in between essays. Very interesting. Do you believe them? Don't know. I think you'd better get up here. I want some metaspace scans of the vicinity around their ship. I've been scanning. Absolutely silent, as far as I can tell. I'm no metaspace expert, of course, but— Granger glanced at the muted image of the Sciora matriarch on the screen. I'd still like you up here. On my way. The calm cut out, and Granger motioned to Prucha and turned back to Krull. Vice Imperator, I hope you can appreciate the difficult position I'm in. On the one hand, I recognize the dire need we all have to trust each other and work together to defeat the Swarm, the Valerissi. And yet, you must realize that I need evidence that you are not under Swarm control. It would be foolish to put our fate in your hands by taking you at your word so blindly. Normally a relationship like this would require time, but time is running out. Krell held up both palms, revealing three long, delicate fingers and one beefier thumb on each hand. The same is true for us, Granger. The Valerici guard knowledge of the other friends very jealously. We know little of the Dolmasi, for example, only that you've been in contact with them. We were there when they became friends and entered the Concordat of Seven, but have not seen them for thousands of years. Similarly, we know little of the Adanasi, the part of your race that has been made friends. We have no idea who among your crew are communicating with the Valerici, or even if you, Granger, are one with them. Through the ligature I sense that you were once a friend, at least. But now— I assure you I'm not. But I propose a test, Vice Imperator. We have the ability to detect the presence of swarm matter in the blood. I assume you have blood. 
Of course. At that moment, Proctor walked through the doors. Granger waved her over. My associate here has developed a test that will reveal whether one is under swarm control or not. Will you submit to the test? I think just your blood will suffice. At the same time, you can watch us test my blood, or if you prefer, we can pass along the method, and your scientists can try it themselves. Proctor's eyes widened almost imperceptibly. It was a huge gamble to tell the Skiora that they had figured out how to detect swarm influence. If the swarm were playing them, they were giving up one of the few intel advantages they had. We accept, said Vice Imperator Krull, and seeing the results from your lab will be sufficient, if you'll permit me to verify them. I will board a shuttle immediately. Shall we meet shuttle to shuttle, or shall I come aboard your ship? Granger had no idea what she meant by verify, but he nodded his agreement. Meet me in our shuttle bay as soon as possible. My superiors have given me a deadline that I must adhere to, or there may be unpleasant consequences. We'll relay coordinates momentarily. He inclined his head towards Ensign Prucha, who began entering in the shuttle bay coordinates into the comm to send to the Skiora. The screen flickered off. Proctor raised her eyebrow. Risky? I know. But I think they're telling the truth. Me too. He motioned toward the doors. Let's go. He glanced over at the deputy XO. Have Sergeant Washington set up in the shuttle bay, guards at the doors and at least twenty more in the hallway beyond, and sharpshooters. But tell him to keep it discreet. Aye, aye, sir, said Diaz. As they walked out the doors, he called back to the tactical station. Time, Mr. Diamond. Forty-five minutes, sir. Damn, he mumbled. We're cutting this a little too close. Damn, he mumbled. We're cutting this a little too close. Chapter 39 Shuttle Bay, ISS Warrior Interstellar Space, 2.4 light-years from Sirius They raced to the shuttle bay, making a quick detour to Proctor's lab to pick up a few sample vials and a blood-draw meta-syringe. When they arrived, the Skiora shuttle was already passing through the force field holding the air in. Granger noticed three men, including Sergeant Washington, perched up on the second-level walkways spanning the perimeter of the room. No weapons were visible, but if they were doing their job, they could get set up for a shot within two seconds. The shuttle landed. It was almost like a miniature version of a swarm carrier. And as the ramp descended, Vice Imperator Krull didn't even wait for it to lock into place as she quickly descended. She was short, no more than five feet, but walked almost disconcertingly fast for such a small person. The view screen hadn't done her justice. Though lithe and thin, a powerful muscle structure flexed noticeably behind her taut, faintly blue-beige skin. He began to wonder if perhaps Vishkane Karsa was right. These people didn't sound like vicious warriors, and they didn't look it. But watching Krull's gait and the way she carried herself, he started to suspect that she could be deadly in a close-quarters fight. Granger. She outstretched her two hands out above her shoulders and to the side, palms toward the two walls. A greeting. He mirrored the motion back to her. She responded with an unexpected laugh. How interesting. Facial expressions, gestures. These all varied. But the laugh seemed to be universal. At least for humans, Domasi and Skiora. You honor me by returning my greeting after what you suppose is our custom— but among us, the mail reaches forward, not to the side. My apologies, said Granger, bringing his arms forward toward her. No need to apologize. No need even to honor our customs. If I knew yours, I would participate. A simple handshake is customary, he said before pausing, thinking better of it. He remembered what happened the last time he'd shaken hands with an alien he'd just met. Vishgane Karsa had implanted the false memory of seeing the swarm homeworld, leading to near disaster. Her hands, still extended to the side, started to quiver. Realizing what she was doing, shaking her hands, he grunted a laugh as well. No, I mean we clasp each other's hands, but that can wait, until we know each other better. I understand. She lowered her arms. He waved Proctor forward. My second-in-command, Shelby Proctor. They nodded at each other. I and all my children greet you both, and thank you. 
Your children, began Proctor. You say they are alive, already individuals. Are they self-aware, conscious? Of course, Krull replied. I know them all, individually. If they ever attain the exterior life, their knowledge and personalities will develop further as they grow. But they are intelligent. I wouldn't be a fraction of what I am now without them. Most of them will never see the light of the exterior life, but the interior life is a full and beautiful one. You rely on them? asked Proctor. Yes. I store memories in them. I confer with them. They help me reason and make judgments and work out problems, even under Valerici control. In a sense, being under their control was almost second nature, as it was just one more voice in my mind, albeit an all-powerful, overriding voice that I could not disobey. And now, for the first time in millennia, my thoughts are free of them, just me and my children in here now, she said, touching her head. If you'll excuse the question, Vice Imperator, exactly how old are you? Measured in the time cycle of our home ships, one thousand and seven. Seven hundred and fifty of your years. I am one of the oldest. My children are on every ship. Thousands of them. I have mated with tens of thousands. Granger and Proctor exchanged significant, uncomfortable glances, but it was fascinating. He had no idea that a species could be so vastly different from themselves, though he supposed it shouldn't come as a surprise, given the extreme biodiversity even on Earth. He wanted to interview her for hours, days. Her people and her culture were beginning to be beautiful to him. But time was running out. Vice Imperator, if you'll permit Commander Proctor to extract a sample he said, indicating the meta-syringe Proctor held. Krull held out a long arm, the muscles rippling subtly beneath the skin. No sagging, no wrinkles. Granger wondered just how old an individual Skiora could get, or how age manifested itself in one of their bodies. So many questions, so much to learn, and so little time. A sample vial filled quickly with blood, which, surprisingly to Granger, came out just as red as his. For some reason he was expecting it to be blue or green or some other alien color. Red, just like him. Even Skura blood flowed red. Proctor nodded. All done, I can get this analyzed in minutes. She pulled out a data pad, brought up a display, and handed it to Krull. Here are the results of Granger's tests. I'm sure the two of you can discuss them further, now if you'll both excuse me. She raced out of the shuttle bay toward her lab. Granger turned back to Krull. As you can see, the virus is still present in my blood, but it has been effectively deactivated. I can still use it to... Uh, how did you put it? Use the ligature? But otherwise it has no sway over me. Krull examined the data displayed on the chart. She appeared to have a decent grasp of English, but he wondered how much of the written language she understood. I see, she said. You mentioned something about verification. Yes. Through the ligature. I can do it mind to mind, but physical contact is more precise. All I need is your hand. He was worried about this. She wanted to do exactly what Karsa had done, get in his head, sift around. Could she alter memories, too? Could she control him? He hesitated. She seemed to sense his uneasiness. You have nothing to fear. I cannot control you. I cannot even control my own children— even the very youngest, at just ninety cycles, has such a ferocious will of his own that I cannot even say good morning to him without getting an ear full. So I'm sure an old man like you is in no danger of influence from me. The youngest is ninety? He decided not to tell her he was sixty-five and had nearly died four months ago. Is touch necessary? No. I can communicate with all my exterior children through the ligature— the one and only good thing that has come from our subservience to the Valerici. And I can communicate with you as well, through the ligature. But the interior children, since they are in physical contact with me, I have immediate access to whatever they want to show me, and while in that communion, one can see through deception. Such it is with the Valerici. There is no lying to them. So it is with my children. If they attempt to deceive, I know it. She laughed. Somehow, despite her alien appearance, the laugh was endearing. 
A mother always knows. And while we commune, in essence, you will be my child. You cannot lie to me, and I will be yours. I cannot lie to you. There was no other way, at least no other timely way. He was sure the hour had elapsed already. Norton and the invasion force would be here soon. With a start, he extended his hand to her. She reached out to his, and they clasped each other. He felt her, there inside of him. Not as an intrusive presence, but almost as a neighbor, standing patiently on the front porch of his mind. At first he didn't know what to do, but as she was just standing there, waiting, expectantly, making no effort to in any way push herself into his thoughts, he projected his own thoughts out at her. With some effort he brought up the image of Proctor extracting a sample of blood from his arm. She collected the vial and inserted it into the imaging scope in her lab. He wasn't there for the actual analysis, and had no mental imagery to project to Krull of that process, but he remembered Proctor summoning him back and showing him the results. The virus, broken down and inactivated. He projected his relief that he felt as Proctor explained that the swarm had no influence over him, that whatever had happened to the virus had made it completely benign, harmless but still useful. With another jerk he stopped. The explanation of why the virus was inactive had started to come to his remembrance, and so he shut it down. There was still no reason he needed to let that slip, that traversing a quantum singularity somehow had the effect of neutralizing swarm virus. He let her hand drop. I understand, she said slowly. He wasn't sure if she had noticed his unwillingness to share everything. You speak the truth. You truly fight the Valerisi, and your blood is cleansed of them. But there is some knowledge you deliberately withhold from me. She looked down at her feet as if considering her words. No matter. I feel your intent. It is not to harm. It is to save. She held her arms out to the side as she did in greeting. I trust you, Captain Granger. He mirrored the motion before remembering what she had said earlier and brought his arms forward as was customary for the males in her race. She laughed again. No, you had it right the first time. Arms forward in greeting in a male, arms to the side for expressions of... Friendship? he asked as she trailed off. Family, she said. With the Valerisi we were friends, or at least their corrupted version of that. But with you, you are family. She paused and closed her eyes momentarily. I have communicated this to the other matriarchs and vice-imperators of the bonded Council of Seven. It is agreed. We will wage war alongside you, for freedom and for family. Granger smiled. It was time to send a metaspace signal out to the fleet, with much better news than he'd hoped. Proctor's voice cut through the silence in the shuttle bay. Captain, just finish the analysis. She's clean. Has a similar inactive virus that you do. Slightly different, that's to be expected, since the Skura biology is not the same as ours. But it's clearly inactive. Any idea why it's different? Probably a species difference. I mean, she's Skura and you're human. I'd expect difference in the way the swarm virus interacts with— Her voice cut out abruptly, replaced by Lieutenant Diaz's. Captain, the fleet has arrived with no warning, and they've started firing on the dreadnought. The fleet has arrived with no warning, and they've started firing on the dreadnought. Chapter 40 Executive Command Center Russian Singularity Production Facility High Orbit Penumbra 3 Mr. Vice President, it is good to finally meet you, said President Malikov. Isaacson noticed that his handshake was frighteningly firm, though not painfully so. After seeing all the propaganda, news vids, and listening in on all the intelligence reports from IDF Intel on the Russian strongman, it was almost surreal to see him there in person, as a real flesh-and-blood individual. Someone real, and not a rumor, a caricature, or a terror, as popular culture in the West tended to depict the man. His accent was obvious, but not too thick. He clearly had a good command of English. Mr. Malikov, the feeling is mutual. President Avery sends her... regards. He chose his words carefully. I'm sure. Malikov turned to Volodin. 
That will be all, Yuri. Isaacson felt Volodin stiffen next to him. He clearly hadn't expected to be dismissed. That was not part of the plan. They discussed the possibilities for how the meeting could play out. Isaacson wasn't quite sure how they'd get the president into a vulnerable enough position to take him out, and they'd rehearsed various scenarios together. Being alone with the president was not one of them. But, Mr. President, I thought we were going to discuss— Alikov waved him off. Later. He pointed to the elevator. Go. Now. Uneasily, Volodin edged toward the door, glancing tentatively at Isaacson, who wanted to protest— to say something to keep the ambassador there. Mr. Isaacson, you'll notice I have no security here with me. I have no need of it. Neither do you. Your men will wait downstairs with Mr. Volatin. Red flags were going off in Isaacson's mind. The Secret Service chief protested. Sir, we're not going to leave you here alone with Mr. Malikov. Malikov turned toward Isaacson. The expression on his face was clear. Are you a man or not? The look on his face, his stance, his upturned eyebrow. They all said the same thing, daring him to dismiss the guards, questioning his resolve, his manhood. Damn it, Isaacson wasn't going to stand for that. No, no, I'll be fine. I'm perfectly safe here. Wait downstairs. But go, shouted Isaacson, pointing toward the elevator door where Volodin waited. He was not going to be second-guessed have his authority questioned in front of the Russian president, who seemed more than in control of his own situation. He could be in control, too, damn it. The Secret Service guards reluctantly filed into the elevator, and a few seconds later, he was alone with President Malikov, who, to Isaacson's surprise, burst out into a boisterous laugh. Ha! <laughs> Did you see the looks on their faces? Sycophants, pretenders and attention-seekers, all of them including good old Yuri. Come on, Mr. Isaacson, let's go discuss matters in my observatory. He started walking toward the door he'd come out of, though Isaacson stayed put, confused. Malikov paused and looked back. You don't trust me, do you, Mr. Isaacson? I don't know you, Mr. Malikov. Plus, we're at war. How can I possibly trust because, Eamon? Can I call you Eamon? Because my estimable opponent... Even though we are at war, I do acknowledge that we are actually on the same side, though you might not realize it. Oh? Isaacson raised an eyebrow and crossed his arms. How so? Melikov paced back to him and put an arm around his shoulders, guiding him toward the door. Because we are both human, and both fight to survive. Individually, nationally, and more importantly, as a race, a civilization. You fight the swarm. I use the swarm, Eamon. I am not to be controlled or taken advantage of by some race of vile, raw sewage. I shit more intelligent sludge than the swarm. I've played for fools many people in my career, Eamon. The United Earth Senate, President Avery, her predecessor, all the governors of all the United Earth worlds and the worlds of the Confederation. But the ones I've played the worst are the swarm. My finest accomplishment, the pinnacle of my career. Isaacson rolled his eyes even as he allowed himself to be led through the door into a large room that looked more like a science laboratory than an office, or what had Malikov called it? An observatory? Please, Mr. Malikov, you're not claiming to have been on our side all along, are you? Just pretending to be allied with the swarm so you can stab them in the back when the stakes are at their highest? I'm a little smarter than that. Your side? You and Avery and the United Earth Government and Senate? No, I am not on that side. But I am on humanity's side. I am humanity's best friend. Isaacson stopped mid-stride. I've heard that language before. The swarm wants to make friends of us all. You're one of them, aren't you? You've been infected. I'm talking to the swarm right now. Malikov laughed, and laughed. Amon, my man, I am one of the few people you've talked to in the last few days that is not infected by the swarm. Isaacson's jaw hung open. Yuri, swarm, confirmed Malikov. My secret service detail, swarm, 
though in their case they've been infected with the backdoor version. He pointed up to an electronic device on the ceiling and another one above the doorframe. Metaspace detection grid. No swarm communication happens anywhere on this station without my knowing about it. I read your security details swarm control the moment they stepped on the station. Not day-to-day -day control. But should it be necessary, the back door can be... potent. As you no doubt discovered with the incident at Wellington Station. The implications ran through Isaacson's mind as he connected the dots. So, the assassination attempt. In Moscow, with the car. Obviously set up by your own men. Not consciously, of course. But it's true. And the incident with the two fighters over North America on your return trip the next day? Also due to your men. Same with Avery's detail, though at least she had the sense to turn most of her security over to the military. And not all of the Secret Service is compromised, but enough. Believe me, the Swarm wants nothing more than to decapitate both governments. Isaacson squinted suspiciously at the other man. How do you know all this? How can I believe you? The main reason is because it makes sense, and you trust your gut, said Malikov as he strode confidently over to a table with a large opaque enclosure resting on top. You're a politician, Eamon. A good one, and very bright. You have a good sense for these kinds of things, and you know I'm telling the truth. The enclosure had a few electronic controls on it, and Malikov pressed a few of the buttons, presenting his finger for an identity scan. But another reason is this. One half of the enclosure turned transparent, almost as clear as glass. Resting underneath it was a naked man. He looked to be awake, but his stare was constant and glassy, as if he were in a daze. Metal rods and electrodes stuck out of his head, and out of his half-open mouth trailed an oxygen tube. Who is he? Malikov saluted toward the prone man behind the enclosure, to Isaacson's surprise. He's a patriot. Warrant Officer Igor Pavlenko. He gave his life to the motherland, though. Malikov glanced up at Isaacson with a grave look on his face. He did not know it at the time. Thought he was volunteering for a special mission. He wasn't aware that mission would be to lie here for ten years. Isaacson, seeing the forest of electrodes, tubes, and rods protruding from the skull, started to understand, putting the pieces together. This is his mission. He wasn't sure whether to feel horror or awe. He supposed he felt both. He's your swarm experiment. See how the swarm matter affects the body. You learned how to control it from him. Malikov shook his head. No, not quite. By the time he volunteered for this mission, I already knew roughly how the swarm communicated and controlled. No, Warrant Officer Pavlenko's mission was not to be an experiment, but to be a back door into the swarm itself. He is fully infected, fully under swarm control, but I've had him heavily sedated and tied in electronically directly to his brain stem, the temporal lobe and the hippocampus. Through those areas, I not only have him immobilized and disabled, but I can decode what he hears through his swarm link and how his brain interprets those signals. You're spying on the swarm. Why do they let you do this? Isaacson was completely befuddled. He knew that Malikov was either playing him, but why? Or feeding him false information that he would take back to Avery, or... Maybe, just maybe, he was telling the truth. A politician, and one at war, no less, giving the truth to his enemy? I can see the doubt in your eyes, Mr. Isaacson. You don't trust me. And I understand that. What I tell you is true, and I'll tell you why it is true. I make no secrets of my aspiration for my culture, my people. I tell you this freely. I do not wish the West to fall, but I want to come out of this war on top, and the West humbled and willing to finally accept friendship with my people, not as superiors, but as equals. And so I tell you the truth because, though lies can be potent tools, the truth is the most powerful weapon of all. Isaacson stood up straight from having stooped to peer at the glassy-eyed Russian soldier. And, Mr. President, what is the truth? Why have you brought me here today? 
Mr. Vice President, my aim is not to control the swarm, not to use them to cow and intimidate the West. My goal, for my entire career, has been to destroy them, once and for all. Has been to destroy them, once and for all. Chapter 41 Shuttle Bay, ISS Warrior Interstellar Space, 2.4 light-years from Sirius Granger dashed to the control station in the shuttle bay and brought up a tactical display on the main panel. Damn! Norton hadn't just brought his boarding ships and a few escort cruisers, he'd brought an entire fleet, admirals and gunos by the looks of it, as the victory hovered in the background. The cruisers were already pounding certain points on the dreadnought softening it up for the boarding parties. Damn it, he muttered and set up a comm link to the victory. Bill, what the hell is going on? I didn't send a signal to attack. Zingano's voice sounded out from the panel. Sorry, Tim. General Norton has operational authority for this mission, by order of the President. But Bill, the Skiora are the real deal. They're allies. I'm absolutely sure of it. A new voice blasted over the speaker, interrupting a response from Zingano. That's what they might want us to believe, Granger, and it might be what you want us to believe. But we've been monitoring metaspace transmissions from you for the past hour, and it's clear you're collaborating with them. Metaspace transmissions? He spun around to crawl. Are you in contact with the swarm? Don't lie to me. Her eyes were closed. All she said was, My children, they are dying. The deep blue eyes opened. We are betrayed. Are you prepared for the full force and fury and the combined might of the Skiora? There was a new menace to her voice. The four marines by the door readied their assault rifles. Granger held out a hand to restrain them. Wait, not until she poses a threat. He regarded her. The depth and wisdom in her eyes was gone, replaced by a deadly fury. I can convince them to stop, but the metaspace communication I need to know. Was it you... Are you still with the swarm? When she didn't immediately answer, he strode over to her and reached out to grasp her hand. Tell me, he said, gripping her hand tightly until his own skin turned white. He gasped. A rush, a flood of emotions washed over him. He felt the pain at a billion deaths. Thousands more were dying by the second, and he felt every one of them. The image, the thought, the impression floated up before his eyes, though he saw nothing, but he knew it all the same. She was telling the truth. It was undeniable. He knew Swarm. He knew what they felt like, their heartless, almost mechanical will to dominate, and this was not it. He jerked his hand away, and even after physical contact was broken, he could still feel the terror of billions. They're dying. The rage in her eyes smoldered. I know, because I trusted you. He dashed back to the terminal and reestablished the link to Zingano. Bill, I'm telling you, this is madness. These people are our allies. They can help us win this goddamned war. Hold your fire! Zingano's heavy sigh greeted him. Tim, listen. We knew this was a possibility. But Avery decided that regardless we would take their ship and point it straight at the heart of the swarm fleet. But we don't even know where that heart is. Damn it, Bill. Can't you see that she's wrong on this one? Norton's voice interrupted again. You're too late, Granger. Save it. The swarm just showed up in force. Now let's get this show on the road. Direct the warrior to run interference against the swarm fleet for our boarding ships. We've got one shot at this, Granger. Don't blow it. And if you disobey orders, I've given Lieutenant Diaz authority to put a bullet in your head and command the warrior himself. Granger glanced at the tactical display and saw a fleet of swarm carriers converging on their position. At least fifty. Shit, they knew we were here. He turned to the Marines. Restrain her, he said reluctantly. The four men bounded forward. Another group of Marines burst out of the service room door nearby. As the first dove for Krull, she somehow caught him in midair, and despite being half his size, flung him around into the second group of Marines. Three more men tackled her. With a yell, she elbowed one in the face, knocking him cold. Another she kicked with a free foot, sending him flying up into the faces of two more marines. Her strength was incredible. 
Carcel wasn't exaggerating. In a way, she looked and sounded like a mother bear, cornered with her cubs, as she bellowed and shouted, struggling against the crowd of soldiers attempting to take her down. Two more went down, unconscious. A third flew across the room into a wall, blood trickling from his nose. Finally, they managed to get her arms behind her back and manacled together, using not one, but two sets of heavy composite steel handcuffs. Another pair clamped around her ankles. One last marine went down as she snapped her spine backward and whipped the back of her head into the chest of the man, tossing him back five meters, clutching his chest. Keep her there in the service room, he said, pointing to the open door to the small room off the shuttle bay. Twenty men are to guard her until I say otherwise. The soldiers saluted, and satisfied she wouldn't escape, he rushed to the bridge. Proctor was in his chair, directing the initial maneuvers. The battle was just spinning up. Zingano and his fleet had already taken out a few carriers, under the cover of the Dreadnought, which was firing at swarm targets seemingly at random. It seems their main attention was drawn inwards, as hundreds of marine transports had already docked. In short, it was one giant mess. But Granger was in the middle of it, and he had a duty to perform. Save the fleet, save the Dreadnought, save humanity's chances against the swarm, and somehow not participate in a genocide. The swarm, and somehow not participate in a genocide. Chapter 42 X-25 Fighter Cockpit, Interstellar Space, 2.5 Light-Years from Sirius Vols looped around a small group of swarm fighters, firing at the ones he could manage to line up in his sights, and leaving the stragglers to Pew Pew and Fodder who were backing him up. At the center of the cloud, flying slowly enough to encourage the cloud of bogies to track her, but fast enough to just barely avoid getting hit by the overwhelming fire, Space Champ zipped around like lightning, distracting the enemy while Vols and the two brothers took out her pursuers. Next time you're the bait, Ballsy, she yelled through the headset. When the last of the fighters disappeared in a puff of debris and goo, she shot forward and leapt into the next horde of oncoming swarm ships. Hey, Ballsy, Fodder's voice blared in his ear. Ain't a word on what we get to dump our bricks. Getting tricky to maneuver with all this mass. He veered left to avoid a formation of bogies that was flying to intercept them and looped around to take them out, but they scattered before he could squeeze off a shot. There haven't been any singularities yet, so we hang on to them for now. Don't worry, you'll get your chance, Mr. Asterix, one big unit. A quick glance out the window as he completed the loop gave him the layout of the battle. The idea fleet had broken up into two attack groups, each taking on about twenty-five swarm carriers on opposite sides of the dreadnought. The Sciora ship occasionally fired at the nearest swarm ships, but for the most part seemed occupied with the thousands of IDF boarding vessels latched onto its hundred-kilometer-long hull. The invasion force led by Colonel Barnard would be slogging through, deck by deck. Though strangely enough, the entire front section of the ship, at least five kilometers, was clear of IDF troop carriers. The nose of his fighter ended up pointed toward the warrior. It was taking a pounding from three swarm carriers that had flanked it, skewering it with beam after deadly beam of antimatter ions. Come on, team, let's go take out some of those turrets, or else we won't have a deck to land on when we get back. They zipped toward the nearest carrier, and once again, Ballsy held his breath as Fodder and Pew Pew seemed to disappear into a cloud of swarm fighters guarding one of the turrets. Every single time they did this, he knew their luck would run out. There was no possible way they could keep coming out of these suicide runs alive. But once again, they both emerged from the other side, taking out the turret with a few well-aimed torpedoes. Pew Pew laughed over the comm. That was a close one, bro! Hey, Bozzy and Space Champ, you gonna let that one stand? Bet you can't do better. He heard Space Champ mutter something under her breath, something about best goddamn pilot ever, and he remembered her pep talk to him in sickbay. She was right. He needed to stop pining. Get in the here and now and blast as many swarm fighters to hell as he could. Suck it, Pew Pew. Watch this. Space Champ, let's go. Turret at 16 Mark III. Fodder snorted over the comm. We got your back. But remember, don't fly like my brother. And remember, came Pew Pew's customary answer, don't fly like my brother. Balsy smiled. This was their element. He and his untouchable crew, they could handle this. He started forward, almost with tunnel vision, even as he concentrated on all the bogies flitting around in his peripherals. 
With Space Champ right in front of him, softening them up, he danced around her, trusting Pew Pew and Fodder to pick off any strays coming in from the rear. One long, eternal minute later, he emerged from the other side, locked a torpedo on the turret, and fist-pumped the air as he watched it explode. Fodder! Where are you, man? Silence. He'll turn up, he always does, said Pew Pew. Trust me, we had to keep a cowbell around his neck when we were kids. You never knew when he was gonna sneak up on you. In the distance, the warrior, in spite of the massive destruction erupting out from its hull in dozens of places, was accelerating towards the nearest carrier, pelting it with thousands of magrail slugs. Vols pushed on the accelerator. Come on, let's go ease your passing. Last one there is a... He glanced at his scope and did a double take. A fighter was flying up and down the length of the carrier targeted by the warrior, taking advantage of the lack of swarm bogies due to the hailstorm of magrail slugs. Fodder? Are you already there? The other man laughed. Lost an engine. Finally got it back online, but my momentum took me over here, so I thought, why not? Why not? Ten thousand high velocity, why nots? Get the hell out of there. You're right in line with the warrior's line of fire. But in spite of the storm of slugs, Fodder managed to flip around and make one more pass, ripping apart two more antimatter turrets before peeling off, joining Ballsy, Pew Pew, and Space Champ where they'd been hitting the carrier on the other end, safely away from the warrior's onslaught. A flicker in his peripheral vision drew his eye, so he craned his neck up and around. A ship, a large ship, had just Q-jumped in, and it was aimed straight at the forward section of the dreadnought on a collision course. He squinted to try and see the nameplate on the hull but in his gut he knew exactly what it was. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Was. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Chapter 43 Bridge, ISS Warrior Interstellar Space, 2.4 light-years from Sirius Captain, three carriers coming in hot pursuit yelled Lieutenant Diaz. Maintain fire on target, said Granger, monitoring the progress of their assault on the swarm carrier they were pummeling in tandem with the ISS Tripoli. Show the incoming carriers our belly. It's already damaged beyond repair, may as well use it as a shield. The warrior twisted, keeping its forward magrail turrets focused on the bleeding carrier, exposing its underside toward the incoming ships, which opened up a full-spread antimatter beam barrage. The walls and deck trembled all around them. Granger gripped the armrests, planting his feet firmly on the deck, willing his ship to hold together. He lost the Constitution. He wasn't going to lose the warrior. Not if he could help it. Reading widespread power failures in the target, all antimatter turrets are quiet, said Ensign Diamond. Flip us around, but maintain course. Target the carrier on the left and swing us around the husk of the carrier we just walloped. Use it as cover. Relay to Tripoli to loop around from the other side and come out firing. We'll cover them. Aye, aye, sir, came several voices as the bridge crew relayed his orders. The battle was a mixed bag so far. Not a complete disaster yet, as they'd managed to take out a dozen carriers, at a loss of only fifteen of their own, IDF's and Granger's best record yet. But the dreadnought was under heavy assault by the Legion of Troop Transports under the command of General Norton and Colonel Barnard. Thousands had already docked, presumably including Colonel Barnard himself, and the hundreds of thousands of marines were doubtlessly locked in deck-by-deck deck bloody melee combat with the Sciora. Pointless violence. Needless blood. And the Sciora's was as red as any of theirs. But Granger had no time to focus on that. Norton was uncompromising and rigid in his mission of taking over the dreadnought at all costs, and Zingano's fleet needed all the help it could get against the surprise appearance of the swarm force. Ask Captain Dillman on the Venacur for help keeping these other two busy while we pick them off one by one, said Granger, noticing that the swarm carriers they'd managed to shield themselves from were angling for a better attack vector. He nodded in approval as, moments later, the Venacur moved up from a deadly flanking angle, making the other two carriers stop in their tracks. Target is neutralized, all turrets quiet, but heavy damage on the Venacur, said Diamond. Good man, Dillman, he murmured. Move on to the next. Granger took a moment to survey the wider battle taking place. Admiral Zingano on the victory was right in the thick of things, rallying a strike force of twenty of his new heavy cruisers, relying on their ultra-thick hull plating to provide cover from the swarm carriers 
as the victory shot them full of tens of thousands of magrail slugs. One of the IDF fleet's attack wings was in bad shape. Half of the cruisers of Delta Wing were belching debris as green swarm beams sliced into them. The other half were gone, disintegrated in expanding fields of wreckage. He saw General Norton's ship, the ISS Lincoln, far in the background beyond them, acting as a command center for the ground army now moving through the decks of the dreadnought. If that attack wing crumbled completely, the Lincoln would be vulnerable to the swarm ships in that vicinity. Swing out! Full acceleration towards the swarm formation at coordinates 32 Mark 5. We need to relieve pressure on Delta Wing. Keep all guns trained on that third carrier as we pass it. The warrior swung wide, out from the cover of the broken swarm carrier they'd used as cover. In the intervening space, a full fighter battle played out, with thousands of IDF birds taking on tens of thousands of swarm bogies. There hadn't been any time to take out the main fighter bays of the swarm fleet, so they had no choice but to engage the full force of the swarm fighter wings. Seventy-five years ago, that's where the swarm got its dreaded name. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of fighters. Overwhelming and incontestable numbers. The idea fighters were holding their own, but it was a bloodbath. Curiously, the swarm had not used any of their singularity weapons, no shimmering points of light to hurl osmium bricks into. Consequently, all of the IDF's fighters were over twice the mass they needed to be. Why do you think they haven't used the singularity, Shelby? Maybe they don't want to risk hitting the dreadnought? Granger stroked his chin. Possibly. Maybe they just ran out of singularities. Unlikely, she replied. I make my own here on the warrior. No reason they can't just keep churning them out. The ship rocked again as explosions rang out from the lower decks. He supposed the mystery would have to wait. Still, if all those osmium bricks were only slowing things down. Commander Pierce, this is Granger, he began speaking to the open air. A moment's hesitation. Pierce here. What is it, Captain? His tone was heavy. He remembered Proctor's lecture from the other day, and he chided himself that he had yet to make time to do what she suggested. How would you like to relieve yourself of a hundred and fifty bricks? They are slowing us down quite a bit, sir. Granger nodded. If we don't see any singularities in the next five minutes, I want you to come up with a plan to launch them at the carriers. Full acceleration, at least twenty seconds. Get them up to over two KPS before they hit. That should punch a few big holes through the bastards. I'll see what I can do, Captain. And Tyler, Granger added. We may need a few Omega runs before this is all over. He thought maybe the CAG could use a warning. The last few times seemed to have affected him quite a bit more than they should have. But losing his family at York, that should have strengthened the man's resolve. No man was more deadly than one who'd lost everything and was fighting out of sheer desperation, revenge, and a sense of common survival for the entire race. He supposed they all had come to that point. No one alive had escaped tragedy. All had lost something. And some had lost everything. I... I understand, sir, said Pierce. Good man. Granger out. He turned to tactical. Time until firing range on our targets. Ten seconds, sir. But that third swarm carrier still has operational antimatter turrets, said Diaz. Leave it to the ISS Vanneker. Focus all fire on the nearest ship of that formation hitting attack wing Delta. The magrail turrets all swiveled in concert, those that remained undamaged, and aimed squarely at a straggling carrier whose attention was focused on an IDF cruiser shuddering under the impact of dozens of antimatter beams. Sir, incoming fleet-wide transmission from General Norton, said Ensign Prucha. All ships near the forward section of the dreadnought are to withdraw to a, a quote-unquote, safe distance. Granger turned to Proctor. Now what is that supposed to mean? she said. It didn't sound good, whatever it was. Patch me through to the Lincoln. Moments later, Norton grumbled out of the calm. What the hell do you want, Granger? Why are we moving away from the dreadnought, General? Sorry, Captain, I won't divulge that information to someone clearly under the influence of the swarm. Damn it, Norton. What are you playing at? Can't you see I'm taking it to the swarm even as we speak? We're laying our asses on the line out here for you, or haven't you noticed? If Delta Wing falls, you're exposed and won't last more than a few minutes against that swarm formation. Norton hesitated. Invasion is going poorly. 
Ascura have mounted a much more formidable defense than even the pessimists expected. How much of the ship do you control? A pause. Less than five percent, but we've gained valuable intel on their ship layout. We're about to hit them in the nerve center where their main ship population is. General, I strongly object. Get them all out of there. Retreat. Ascura are peaceful and can be powerful allies. You don't know what can it, Granger. Stand back and watch the fireworks. This maneuver should be familiar to you. What the hell did he mean by that? But he didn't even have time to voice the question. The calm cut off. Moments later, commotion came from the tactical station. Holy shit! yelled Diamond. Granger shot to his feet reflexively. What? It's the Constitution, sir. What's left of it? On screen. The view on the screen shifted from the ongoing battle with the swarm formation besieging Delta Wing to a wide-panned shot of the front of the dreadnought. Off in the distance, his old ship, the old bird, still broken and hobbled from its final battle and descent to Earth, closing at lightning speed straight for the dreadnought. Closing at lightning speed straight for the dreadnought. Chapter 44 Executive Command Center, Russian Singularity Production Facility, High Orbit, Penumbra 3 You? Destroy the swarm? Isaacson scoffed. Complete eradication, replied Malikov, nodding. That's ambitious. Isaacson eyed the president, his head cocked, wondering what the game was. The man was clearly either delusional or playing him. I am a man of ambition, Eamon. When I see something I desire, I take it. When it is out of my reach, I plan, meticulously, how I may obtain it. And when there is a trophy that everyone claims is unreachable, it only makes me want it more. And I achieve it. From the very public, macho exploits of the President, Isaacson knew he meant every word. He had something to prove, for sure. The man had a very high opinion of himself, though in this case Isaacson suspected he'd bit off more than he could chew. The war was going very badly for humanity, even considering the Russians were temporarily safe and supposedly on the same side as the swarm. But he knew that wouldn't last. Once United Earth fell, there would be nothing stopping the swarm from turning their attention to the Russian Confederation, and unless Malikov knew something about the state of their military that Isaacson didn't, they wouldn't last long. Mr. President, what makes you think you can eradicate the swarm? They can control us, infiltrate us up to the highest levels. Their fleets seem endless. They've got the Skiora under their control, and supposedly at least three other races that we haven't even heard of. What happens when they show up? Have you even considered this? He parroted the list of concerns he had heard from Avery and her senior commanders during the strategy sessions he had been allowed to participate in. Malikov touched the enclosure's electronics, and the clear material turned opaque again, shrouding the naked soldier from view. He motioned to another door, leading to a smaller side room containing some other scientific equipment. Let me tell you a story, Eamon. He pulled a chair up to one of the machines and began touching a few spots on the computer screen next to it. The story begins seventy-five years ago, Malikov began, still touching certain areas of the screen and shuffling through several menus. Unfortunately, Isaacson didn't read a word of Russian, and didn't even recognize half of the Cyrillic alphabet. It actually started ten thousand years ago, but seventy-five is where we show up, and that is all that matters. The swarm awoke from its cycle, which, decades later, our scientists determined was about one hundred and fifty years long. They came, they devastated Earth and dozens of other worlds, but they encountered unexpectedly fierce resistance from humanity. Though they probably would have won had the war continued, their period of wakefulness was near its end, and they knew they would not be able to complete the invasion before they needed to rest, to enter their refractory period. So it really was just luck that they disappeared. Basically, yes. Their plan was to return in one hundred and fifty years, rely on their client races, the Dolmasi, the Skiora, etc., to improve swarm technology and ships to the point that, when the swarm awoke again, they'd conquer humanity with ease. But they came early, 
said Isaacson. They came early. Was it something humanity did, or was it spontaneous? Malikov laughed. Of course it was humanity, or more precisely, it was me. You? Isaacson couldn't believe his ears. Why would the Russian president, knowing the destruction that would likely await it, awake humanity's mortal enemy? Why? It seems like an incredibly foolish thing to do. Oh, I didn't do it on purpose, of course. My top scientists were devising a new weapon, something we could use against the swarm when they returned as well as against uh, less friendly elements of human civilization. Here, let me show you. He finished typing commands in. He had apparently done this before, and Isaacson thought it strange that the other man was so well versed in the operations of such technical equipment. The top of the machine, which before had been just as opaque as the enclosure covering the soldier, turned transparent, and Isaacson peered inside. A white, shimmering light glowed in the middle, just barely visible. Occasionally it would flash, but most of the time Isaacson had to squint to see it properly. Is that what I think it is? Mini Singularity? Yes. The very first one, in fact. And its sibling. They are so close to each other that your eyes can't separate the two. And how do you keep them stable? How do you prevent them from gobbling up the entire station? Proprietary information, Mr. Vice President. But I will tell you that the popular understanding of black holes is simplistic and mistaken. For example, this singularity weighs less than a femtogram. You'd need a billion billion of these to equal a kilogram, and your average natural black hole is a million billion 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 kilograms, give or take a billion billion. Needless to say, it's quite easy to use our regular gravity plates to manipulate these. Modified gravity plates, of course. But we discovered something even more interesting. You can only create them in pairs. And furthermore, what goes in one will come out its sibling sometime later. The exact timing depending on our gravitational input parameters. And so I thought, what if we could use this to destroy the swarm's homeworld, even as they slept? Ensure they never come back. But they came back early, Isaacson repeated. So they did. But I merely adjusted the plan. I gave them the Singularity technology in exchange for my autonomy. All my top commanders, most of my top leadership, they were all infected with swarm virus. But this technology was so valuable to them, they agreed to let me keep control over myself and my government, as well as to monitor what the swarm network was telling my people to do through the Patriot soldier you saw earlier in that pod. But why give them the technology they could use to destroy humanity? Because, Mr. Vice President, I figured I could hit two birds with one stone, two enemies with the same arrow. Your United Earth Senate and the previous administration was so perversely anti-Russian that it became clear to me if I wasn't going to stick up for my people, no one was. The only answer was for the West to be humbled, and what better way to do that than to have the swarm do it for me? I'm never one to do my own dirty work, Mr. Vice President. I don't do my own laundry. I don't scrub my own toilets. I'm certainly not going to fight my own wars. Why do that when I can get my enemies to destroy each other for me? Isaacson stroked his chin, regarding the shimmering light in the vacuum chamber. The occasional flashes must have been when the occasional stray air molecule got too close to the minuscule event horizon and vaporized. Or at least that's what he reasoned. He supposed an actual scientist would say something similar, but with larger words. Still, Mr. Malikov, surely you'd realize that once the swarm finished with United Earth, they'd turn the weapons back on you. Did you really think they'd let you keep your autonomy? Of course, that was a possibility. But you see, Mr. Isaacson, that would require them to still be alive at the end of the war with United Earth. Something that won't happen. In fact, I've brought you here to witness the end of the swarm. Here? The swarm will be eradicated here? I don't see any fleets and shipyards, any bases. Isaacson turned back to look through the giant viewport at the end of the observatory. Just the planet below. 
turning serenely and slowly, its vibrant blue surface pockmarked by a few clouds. A small moon with its field of dust and rocks hovered in the background in a higher orbit. Unless... Is that... He pointed out the window toward the planet. It is. Was it possible? Could it be true? Had the Russians known the location of the swarm homeworld this whole time, and sat on the information until United Earth had been sufficiently broken that Malakov could end the war and destroy the swarm, assured in the knowledge that Russian hegemony over humanity would never be seriously challenged for centuries? Millennia? Impossible. The swarm would never have entrusted Malakov with knowledge of the homeworld's location. Even they weren't that stupid. They were probably leading Malakov along, letting him believe it was their home. So you're just going to shoot your own singularities down there? Is that what the station is for? Malakov waved a hand. Of course not. I told you I don't do my own dirty work. I'll let the swarm do it for me. You're forgetting, Mr. Isaacson. The singularities come in pairs. What goes in one comes out the other. The swarm have been using these things for months, ravaging the surfaces of dozens of worlds, sucking up billions of billions of tons of material. But here's the secret, Mr. Isaacson. I only ever gave them half of the singularities. The other half, all the siblings, I kept here. Or rather, there, he said, pointing out the viewport. Toward the moon. Isaacson stood up and walked toward the glass, following Malakov's finger, and then he finally noticed something odd. It wasn't a moon. Drifting distantly in its orbit, hundreds of thousands of kilometers away, it was much closer than he'd realized. Now that he focused on it, he could see it was enormous. It seemed to have its own hazy atmosphere, though Isaacson supposed that was just dust and debris colliding with each other grinding down to ever smaller particles, clinging tentatively to the ball of rocks through their weak gravitational pull. But that wasn't all. It was growing. Right before Isaacson's eyes he saw a flash, and another giant ball of material appeared a few kilometers away, tumbling and swirling as it fell down into the maelstrom of rock and debris. Have you ever wondered what a small moon striking the surface of a planet looks like? That's how they say the Earth's moon was created. A large planetoid struck Earth with such terrifying force that enough material was sloughed off to form a satellite, leaving a molten, hellish planet behind. Of course, this moon isn't quite as big, but it should do the trick. Haven't the swarm seen this? Surely they'll try to stop it. That's the thing with singularities, Eamon. I've timed them, all to arrive here, at this moment no matter their place or time of origin. The debris moon has only been forming for the last few hours and is nearly complete. And has the swarm noticed it? Will they do something about it? What can they do? By the end of the day, that debris moon's orbit will decay, and the whole thing will slam into Penumbra Three, eradicating every living thing within a hundred kilometers of the surface. Isaacson stared at the ever-growing cluster of rocks and debris in awe. He could only imagine the utter destruction such a large mass would trigger when it collided with the planet below. The atmosphere would ignite. The upper crust would liquefy into an ocean of lava. Nothing could possibly survive. He really was going to eradicate the swarm. He really was going to eradicate the swarm. Chapter 45 Bridge, ISS Warrior Interstellar Space, 2.4 light-years from Sirius There was nothing he could do but watch, helplessly. Impact would be in seconds, no time to call Norton, to plead with him, no time to move the warrior to intercept. No time. The explosion was tremendous, spectacular, blinding. And just like that, the old bird to which he had thought was being repaired and retrofitted back on Earth, was gone. Again. The dreadnought was belching flame, molten metal, debris, wreckage, twisted metal and solid, glowing chunks of hull. Even though the massive ship was nearly a hundred kilometers long, 
It began to list and rotate as it absorbed the momentum of the Constitution, which had come in with terrifying velocity. And he felt someone screaming in the back of his mind, someone nearby. It was Krull, he knew. She was feeling the death throes of her people, not just the tens of thousands aboard the Dreadnought living their exterior lives, but the billions of Skiora still living their interior lives inside their mothers. Genocide. Get me, Norton, back, he said almost in a whisper. You're on, Captain, replied Prucha. Norton, you bastard! What have you done? What have I done, Granger? I'm winning. You've killed billions of innocent Skiora lives. Innocent Skiora lives? You're delusional, Tim. They've got you. They're in your head. Think about it. Why have the Skiora only barely fired on the swarm? They haven't destroyed a single carrier, and the reason why is obvious. They've been playing you. There was crosstalk on the other end of the comm, and then Norton continued. There, see? Now the dreadnought is firing on us. How do you explain that, Granger? Granger glanced at the tactical display. It was true. Several antimatter beams shot out from the dreadnought toward Delta Wing. That's clearly self-defense. We were the aggressors here, not the Skiora. Bullshit, Granger. Treasonous bullshit. Now your orders are to continue— The transmission cut out. On the display, several beams stretched out from the dreadnought towards the ISS Lincoln, though at such a large distance the beams were more diffuse. Still, the damage probably knocked out Norton's comlink for the time being. It was a disaster. The front twenty kilometers of the dreadnought were utterly devastated with a constitution-sized hole in it. The remains of his old beloved ship had blown out the back in the form of dozens of chunks of molten tungsten. The Skiora, as evidenced by the still screaming presence of Krull in the back of his mind, were enraged. The swarm was pounding Delta Wing, and Zingano's efforts with Alpha Wing had started to go south. Pure, utter disaster. We're going to lose the war, he muttered. He no longer cared who heard him. Proctor had come up behind him. The Marines might still take the ship. Granger shook his head. No, they won't. You didn't see Krull fight. It took half a platoon to restrain her, and she was unarmed. Our boys don't stand a chance, no matter how many of them the old bird took out. The warrior had been pounding the nearest swarm carrier with magrail slugs, and now that it was in the midst of the formation locking down Delta Wing, the IDF ships had a chance to regroup. Half of them went to the aid of the Lincoln. The other half formed a two-pronged trident line that Zingano favored in his engagements and re-engaged the swarm formation of carriers. Tim, Proctor said. Her voice had changed whereas before she had sounded like she was trying to keep hope alive. This time she was resigned. Look, Zingano and Alpha Wing. While the warrior had been busy assisting Delta Wing, the tide had turned for Alpha. Ship after ship exploded. The rest were flanked by fifteen surviving swarm carriers who'd backed them up into the dreadnought, which was shooting out the occasional antimatter beam as well. Victory was getting hammered. Warrior bucked beneath them, its underside was a wreck, with hull breaches reaching all the way up to engineering. Half its mag rails were gone. None of the laser turrets were operational. They'd never even had the chance to try out the new experimental antimatter torpedoes that IDF armaments had stocked them with on Avery's orders, as all the launch tubes were destroyed. They were on their last legs. Granger punched the comm. Mr. Pierce, it's time for some fancy brickwork from our pilots. Are they ready? Silence. Mr. Pierce, please respond. The comm link was open, and he even thought he heard background noises, possibly heavy breathing, but there was no response. He glanced up at Proctor. Now what? Get down there, Shelby. Proctor. Now what? Get down there, Shelby. Chapter 46 Fighter Bay, ISS Warrior. Interstellar Space, 2.4 light-years from Sirius. Proctor ran. Even as the hallways shook, buckling under the sustained fire from the swarm carriers, she sprinted to the fighter bay. Leaping over fallen girders, strewn battle debris and even two injured crew members, bloody from being tossed against bulkheads. Less than a minute later she burst into the fighter bay. 
The deck chief looked up in surprise from haranguing a young tech who was refueling a fighter. She dashed toward the CAG's office, but nearly collided with the door when it did not open automatically for her. The door control was unresponsive. Cursing, she looked up to the window just above her head, where the CAG and his crew could look out at deck operations as they directed traffic and tactical operations. You! She called to a tech nearby who was busy opening a new container of fighter ordnance. Roll that over here! Now! Flustered and red-faced, the young woman pushed the large wheeled box of rounds toward the window. Proctor joined her, pulling on it, guiding it into position. She jumped on top, craning her neck to peer up into the fighter deck operations center. Commander Pierce was alone, sitting in his chair next to the console. She could barely hear Granger's voice yelling out of the comm speaker. On Pierce's lap was a photograph. In his hands was a gun. He stared at it. No! she yelled, pounding on the window. His head jerked up toward her. His eyes were swollen and red, his face tormented and twisted. Oh, God, she thought. She saw in his eyes only one thing. Hopelessness. He'd given up. The pain had consumed him. He'd made his choice. No, she shouted again, pounding on the window. Pierce, we need you. But it was too late. His hand trembled as it brought the gun up to his mouth, his eyes shut. Even from behind the window, the shot rang in her ears. A stream of red followed the bullet when it came out the top. He jerked and slumped. Blood poured from his nose. She leaned her forehead against the window, still pounding on the glass with a fist, and for the first time since the invasion of Earth, she cried. Granger is right. We're going to lose. Granger is right. We're going to lose. Chapter 47 Bridge, ISS Warrior Interstellar Space, 2.4 light-years from Sirius Granger heard the gunshot through the comm speaker and knew immediately what it meant, without having to ask Proctor. Pierce! The rumble of distant explosions answered him. Tyler! He should have listened to her. Should have taken her advice more seriously. Paid attention to his crew. He was so consumed with winning, with victory, with saving the human race, that he forgot about the humans around him. They were people. And people could break. Shelby. He began, his voice low. Can you hear me? The comm crackled as the computer automatically patched him to the nearest comm receiver. Yes, Tim. Is he dead? Yes, Tim. Another explosion, this time throwing all of them against their restraints. The warrior didn't have long to live either. Shelby, we need a CAG. Someone the pilots trust. Who's the most senior? After a moment, she answered. Ballsy. He almost protested not wanting to trust such a huge responsibility to someone so young, so full of adrenaline and testosterone. Plus, the kid had had it in for him ever since he came back from the singularity claiming to see a swarm-infested granger on the other side. But he'd been with the crew from the beginning. For some reason, Granger considered the formal decommissioning ceremony of the Constitution the beginning. That was when his crew was born, when the fire started raining down. The champagne bottle breaking at the ship's christening was the pleasant baptism of water. The baptism by fire was what really made a person. Made a crew. Is he there? No, sir. He's out in his bird. He motioned over to Prucha. Put him on. Could he do this? Could Granger do this? It felt hopeless at this point. So pointless. Why continue? Why keep on fighting if the cold death of space awaited them all in just a few minutes? He noticed the bridge crew staring at him despondently. They were used to seeing the hero of Earth in action, sure and confident in himself and his crew. Damn it. I still need their hero. Could he pull things together one last time? Here, sir, came Valls's voice. Ballsy, he said using the semi-vulgar call sign. He'd act a swaggering hero, if only for a few more minutes. 
I hereby appoint you CAG. Your mission? Kick ass. Uh, yes, sir. And your first assignment as CAG is to take out ten swarm carriers in the next five minutes. Can you do that, Lieutenant? Vols flustered. Sir? I don't even think that a thousand fighters... Belzy, I gave you an order. I didn't ask for excuses or hesitation. Now, by my count, you've got over a hundred fighters with osmium bricks slowing them down and no singularity targets to hurl them at. The warrior is about to make an Omega run to end all Omega runs against the swarm formation harassing the victory, and I want to see some epic ball-busting on your end, got it? Yes, sir. Commander Proctor will stay in the Fighter Combat Operations Center and direct things until you manage to get back in. But don't come back without blowing up a few Comrade ships. Granger out. Don't come back without blowing up a few Comrade ships. Granger out. Chapter 48 Fighter Bay, ISS Warrior Interstellar Space, 2.4 light years from Sirius One of the fighter deck technicians managed to wrest the door open to the combat operations center, and Proctor took the steps three at a time. The CAG's assistants followed him in. They'd been sent away, for whatever reason, by the late Pierce, and when she finally saw the body, surprisingly it didn't faze her so much as anger her. As much as she wanted to respectfully pick up the body and lay it gently in the corner, there was no time. She unceremoniously shoved Pierce out of the chair, and in spite of the blood soaked into the fabric and pooled on the floor beneath him, Proctor sat down and pulled herself up to the console. She took in the tactical situation. Ninety-eight fighters left. She breathed a quick sigh of relief when she saw that the untouchable crew was still alive. That meant their new CAG wasn't dead yet, at least. That would have been a new record two CAGs within ten minutes. She keyed herself into the whole fighter wing. This is Proctor. Balsy is the new CAG, people. But until he gets back to the nest, I'm it. Form up into your squadrons. Ignore the swarm fighters. New target is the swarm formation currently picking apart Alpha Wing of the fleet. Two fighter squadrons per carrier. Full acceleration until you reach maximum safe breakaway speed, then release bricks. Target... She paused. She knew eight osmium bricks wouldn't be enough to disable a swarm cruiser, at least not at these speeds, but they would at least neutralize twenty-eight antimatter turrets, which would at least buy Warrior, Victory, and Alpha Wing a few more minutes. One brick per antimatter turrets. My lovely assistants will make individual squadron assignments. She glanced at Lieutenant Schweitzer and Ensign Spritty. Damn. They looked too young to even be in flight school, let alone have graduated. Granger's voice blared out of the calm. Shelby, you ready down there? She watched the tactical layout as the fighters started to respond, and winced as two more birds blinked out as they were caught in a swarm crossfire. Fighters moving into position, sir. Good. Warrior will head out now and hopefully distract their attention away from your people. The comm channel stayed on, and Proctor heard Granger give the order for full thrust toward the swarm formation, now at eighteen carriers. On the tactical display, she saw that Alpha Wing was just barely hanging on. Only fifteen ships, half of those disabled, but their fighters still fought desperately. And they'd apparently caught on to the lack of singularities, too, as they'd begun launching their osmium bricks at the carriers as well. In such close quarters and with low speeds, though, the bricks were significantly less effective. Time to ramp things up. The warrior started to pull away from the remains of the battle near Delta Wing and accelerated up to half a KPS, then three quarters. Soon they'd reached a full kilometer per second, and they were over halfway there, guns blazing, warriors, and Granger's signature move. She noticed they were aimed at one of the carriers, not dead center, but at an angle such that the underside of the warrior, already devastated from multiple battles using it as a shield for the rest of the ship and other IDF vessels, would bear the brunt of the glancing collision. Not quite an Omega run, but the experience would not be a joyride. The fighters were in position, lined up by squadron and already accelerating toward their targets. Showtime. Squadron and already accelerating toward their targets. Showtime. Chapter 49 X-25 Fighter Cockpit Interstellar Space, 2.4 light-years from Sirius. Vols and his untouchable crew were lined up in their brick-launch formation. Not a static line, 
no sense in providing the swarm fighters with easy targets, but they'd settled into a near-maximum acceleration vector alongside the warrior, making occasional evasive maneuvers to avoid the stray bogey while lining up their sights on the assigned targets. 2 KPS 2.5 KPS 3 KPS At this speed, the explosive energy from the osmium bricks tearing through the swarm's hull would be unstoppable. The carriers might be huge, but a solid chunk of metal the size of a fighter slicing its way down the entire length of a ship was something else entirely. Launch in ten, said Commander Proctor through the comm. Vols was still trying to wrap his head around being the new CAG, but he pushed it from his mind. He didn't need to think about that until he got back. Look sharp, people, he said. Keep an eye out for bogeys as you launch. He kept the nose of his bird lined up on the assigned carrier and centered an antimatter turret in his scope. Might as well make sure he at least took one of those out. Three, two, one, launch, Proctor shouted. Vols pressed the release trigger after one final burst of acceleration, then immediately kicked in his reverse thrusters and veered away from the carrier before he slammed into it. Blazing by the swarm ship at breakneck speed, he craned his neck around to see if he could catch a glimpse of the aftermath, making sure the auto-deceleration subroutine was engaged. Sure enough, the carrier his crew had targeted suddenly had four gaping holes from where the remains of the osmium bricks had shot out the backside. Secondary explosions erupted all over the ship. The carrier wasn't destroyed. It still hobbled along and even attempted to veer out of the way of the warrior. But the guns all fell silent. Yeah! shouted Pew Pew. Fodder's outburst was less positive. Oh, shit. What happened? said Space Champ. Release mechanism malfunctioned, said Fodder. My brick is still attached. Pew Pew snorted. Well, Mr. Asterix, one big unit, we can always help you get it off. That's what she said, Fodder quipped. Here, let me shoot it out from under you. Turn around and hold still. I hate it when other men tell me that. Guys, another time, please. Valls was watching out the viewport at the aftermath of the modified Omega run. The warrior was coming in fast toward a carrier that was still actively firing. Destructive green beams lacerated the warrior's already devastated hull. That's not just an intercept course, people. Space Champ swore quietly. Fodder and Pew Pew swore less quietly. She's coming in for an actual Omega run, said Valls. Damn, that dreadnought had better be worth it. Valls. Damn, that dreadnought had better be worth it. Chapter 50 Bridge, ISS Warrior Interstellar Space, 2.4 Light Years from Sirius Time! Ten seconds, said Ensign Prince. Granger tightened his seat restraints. This would be a wild ride, if they survived it at all. All hands, brace for impact! And again to Ensign Prince at the helm. Look sharp, Mr. Prince. Just a graze. Slide along the surface and take out as many turrets as we can. Doing my best, sir. Granger nodded. I know you are, son. A damn fine job you're doing, too. He added, remembering Proctor's recent lectures. He'd failed Commander Pierce. He wouldn't fail the rest of them. At least not in the few minutes they had left. The distance separating them from the carrier shrunk at an alarming rate, and before he knew it they hit, grinding across the surface, their hulls scraping together. The ten meters of tungsten armor plating served the warrior well, preventing the swarm hull from gouging up into it too deeply. But the energy of the collision shocked them all. He was thrown against his restraint so hard he was worried he'd snap his neck. He knew there were injuries among the bridge crew, as some of the officers didn't have the full restraints he did, and he knew in his gut that many in the lower decks had perished. They shed velocity quickly, and when they'd flown past the carrier, the warrior's lower hull glowed red. One more, Mr. Prince. Slide us along the carrier just ahead. They repeated the modified Omega run, thrusters pushing them into position until they started grinding against the hull of a second swarm carrier, knocking down turret after turret. Antimatter beams from a dozen other carriers ripped into the upper hull, flashing green across the view screen until their view was almost completely washed out. Fighter Bay reports brick deployment. Ninety-five launched over eighty-five antimatter turrets destroyed across ten carriers, said Diaz. The viewscreen flashed with green beams, but noticeably fewer. 
The remaining Alpha Wing cruisers were regrouping, concentrating their fire on the swarm carriers that still had full guns. Captain, came a tired voice from the comm. Granger had been waiting for this call from his chief engineer. Yes, Reyna. That second run cut through our main coolant line. Did you shut down the plant? Silence. It's... It's stuck, sir. The automatic shut-off is damaged, and the manual controls are... Well, the compartment they're in is open to space at the moment. He grit his teeth. How long? Less than five minutes, until we lose reactor containment. After that, we'll have less than a minute until we go boom. Let's... Let's just make it an even five. She sounded oddly calm about losing her second ship. If he remembered correctly, her grandfather had been the assistant chief engineer aboard the warrior in his time. He hoped it had been worth it. Understood, Commander Scott. He flipped on his general alert comm. All hands. He glanced over at Diaz, who nodded gravely. Abandon ship. All hands to escape pods. Ship destruction in less than five minutes. Repeat. Abandon ship. The bridge crew ripped off their seat restraints as they began to exit. The bridge was deep in the core of the ship, and the nearest space pods were a good two minutes away. He eyed the tactical display, noticing a third carrier ahead of them that was still firing, and intercepted Ensign Prince before the young man stepped away from the helm. One more thing, Mr. Prince. He pointed down at the tactical display on the helm's console, and tapped his finger on the image of the swarm ship ahead of them. This carrier's fighter bay doors are open. I want the nose of the warrior stuck in there before we leave. A minute later, Ensign Prince nodded as the ship swayed again. Done, sir. We're lodged pretty firmly in there. Good. Go. Get to your skate pod. Prince ran out the doors. Only himself and Proctor left. She'd run up from the fighter bay when he'd called for the evacuation. I need to pick up a few things from my lab on the way. And Fishtail. She might still be a valuable link to the swarm if we need it. A voice called out in the back of his mind. Damn it. He'd forgotten Krull in the last few minutes. She was still down in the shuttle bay, restrained, angry, despondent at losing so many of her children and her people. Go. I've got one more thing to do. Get to the victory. They both raced out the doors. The customary marine guard had left and the hallways were empty. At the intersection they parted and Granger rushed toward the shuttle bay, three decks down and toward starboard. He took the stairs two at a time, counting down silently in his head the remaining seconds they had left. Less than three minutes, he figured. The shuttle bay was empty, except for Krull's shuttle still parked on the landing pad next to the warrior shuttle. He opened the door to the control room, expecting to see the Skiora still bound with cuffs around her wrists and ankles and tied to the chair. A dead marine lay slumped against the wall. The chair was empty, the handcuffs lying broken on the floor. The chair was empty, the handcuffs lying broken on the floor. Chapter 51 Executive Command Center, Russian Singularity Production Facility High Orbit, Penumbra 3 Why are you telling me all this? Said Isaacson, though in his gut he knew there were only two possible answers. Either the Russian president was monologuing before he struck, satisfying his inner supervillain, or, Because I need you, Mr. Vice President. Together, after all this is over, we can build a better world. You're someone I know I can work with. Or Malikov was looking for another tool. He was planning on using Isaacson for his own purposes. Just like Avery. Just like, he supposed now, Volodin. Damn it. Just like every politician and military commander he'd ever met. In all his interactions with any person in a position of power or influence, that's all he ever was to them. A tool. A means to an end. Avery with her thirty implants she'd injected into him. Volodin and his swarm masters with his flattery and scheming. Helping Isaacson with his initial attempts to kill Avery. All while avoiding IDF defenses during the first foray against Earth. To all of them, Isaacson was not a partner. Not a colleague. He was an instrument to enable the aspirations of others, nothing more. Anger boiled up inside of him. Not anymore. Not anymore. 
he resolved to start using others, to make them his tools. Use them to boost himself, use them in his own plans. Stop being the pawn and be the queen. Or king. No, queen. Damn it. I agree, Mr. President. What do you need me to do? Isaacson smiled eagerly. His first tool, Malakov. Convince him that Isaacson was an eager and willing partner. Do what it took to gain his trust. Then turn the tables. Make the other man a pawn in his own schemes. Malikov looked surprised just for a moment. Well, I admit that was easier than I thought it would be. Are you so eager to turn on your own government, Eamon? Just like you said, Mr. President. I don't see it as turning on my government. I see it as saving our civilization. Finally achieving peace between East and West after all these centuries. He turned away from the window, away from the massive ball of gathering debris and faced the Russian strongman. How can I help? The sooner we end this, the faster I can take over for Avery, make an alliance and start rebuilding. Isaacson hoped playing up the Avery replacement angle would convince the man. He had been trying to kill her for years, after all. Malikov would certainly believe his sincerity. Of course, replied Malikov smoothly. In fact, that's part of why I brought you here. I have a recently acquired tool in my possession that I think you can make use of to both take out Avery and possibly even some of the swarm's most deadly allies. The Skiora ships are, well, gargantuan. They've been one of the uncertainties in my plans. I never knew how they'd feel once the swarm were destroyed, but recent developments will make that less of an uncertainty and more of a bond between us, Eamon. You see, I'm going to give you the means to destroy the Skiora. At the same time, I destroy the Swarm and Avery. All of humanity will be so grateful to the both of us that, well, let's face it, we'll be presidents for life. And just what is this most recent development? Come. Malikov shut off the view screen to the singularity enclosure, and the walls became opaque once more. He strode off toward another door on the open side of the giant viewport covering the wall. It slid open, revealing what looked like a medical examination room. A tall window was set into one wall, while the other walls were covered with monitors and medical equipment, cabinets and diagnostic equipment showing the steady pulse of a person lying on the only bed in the room. Isaacson passed the threshold, staring at the man on the bed. Impossible! I was expecting him, given events over Earth, four months ago. The blanket covered most of his body, leaving his head exposed. His face was white and haggard, as if sick from a deadly disease. Captain Granger. From another time. Alive, but only just. Another time. Alive, but only just.